I forgot to, to mention uh, that uh, the Pearsons are out today, and so um, which is why we just get to hear Kelly's voice over and her piano playing over the speaker today. And so we're grateful for technology, and we pray for their travel uh, as well. Will you join me in prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know what? I kind of like this Jesus that we get in this story. That raw, that angry, that real, that the human interaction that he gives to the people in the temple. I get it. Man, oh man, do I get that feeling. I have on so many different occasions wanted to walk into churches and start flipping tables, haven't you? You claim to be a home for grace and compassion and God's love, and yet you turn people away and spread lies about them. Table flipped. You claim the gospel for the sick, impoverished, and those in need, and yet you fly in a private jet to a private resort off the money your congregation has entrusted you with. Table flipped. And another one, and another one. I think we've all been there. But as much as I like this Jesus, I think that table flipping part of our, this story gets way too much attention. Yes, we should pay attention to the angry table flipping Jesus because that is Jesus' humanity on full display. And anger as our friend Koaleth from Ecclesiastes, who we heard from over the last few weeks, says that there is a time for anger. But this event in the temple didn't happen in a vacuum. And so what I think gets overlooked is that Jesus had probably become accustomed to this behavior in the temple. He probably experienced it in the temple when he was a child. But that day, I think, was the last day Jesus was going to put up with it. I think he was exhausted and tired of it. Tired of the temple not being for worship, but for people to come and sell their goods. Tired of the temple being taken over by, prof by the prophets, or by the people profiting off of the goodwill of worshipers. Jesus was at the end of his whip of cords. He had no more time for any of this. So what Jesus says next in the scripture in alluding to his resurrection and that his body, the temple, would be raised in three days, I find quite interesting. Which is where we'll pivot to Henry Nouwen, who we have been walking with over the last few weeks as well. Henry writes in his book called The Inner Voice of Love, A Journey Through Anguish to Freedom. He writes, When you get exhausted, frustrated, overwhelmed, or run down, your body is saying that you are doing things that are none of your business. God does not require of you what is beyond your ability. God does not require of you what leads you away from God or what makes you depressed or sad. So I think Jesus was tired. His body, the temple, was doing things it shouldn't be doing. The temple was taking God's name in vain. The temple, when Jesus refers to it as His body, he is tired of watching the real, physical, historical temple turn into a marketplace. As Christians, we often hear the body of Jesus referred in many different ways. Some Christian traditions believe that at this table, the bread becomes the literal body and the wine becomes the literal blood of Jesus. And often... We, the church, refer to ourselves as the hands and feet of Jesus when we are doing good work in the community. And then generally, 
the church is often referred to as the body of Christ. And if you've ever studied Christian architecture, which I'm sure all of you have got your masters in at some point, but throughout the ages, you'll notice that the cathedrals, from an aerial view, they make a cross. And a lot of the parts are named after body parts. The central part of, of the church is called the nave, which comes from navel, belly button. And then there's this part in cathedrals called the apse, A-P-S-E. And this is no joke, but the apse is the part of the church that sticks out and is usually semicircular. But the etymology of apse, A-P-S-E, is apsis. Got any astronomers in here today? Well, the apsis is the planet or the satellite that is furthest from the body in which it encircles. So the apse, A-P-S-E, is the furthest part of the church away from the body. But if you just got really excited to hear another word that you thought I was saying just a few minutes ago, come back in a few weeks on Palm Sunday and you will hear that word from our scripture. <laughs> but of course, we can read Henry Nouwen's quote that we just heard and apply it to our own individual lives. And that's why he wrote it. But it can also be read understanding the body as the church. When the church body becomes tired and exhausted, it's time to stop doing that which drains us and look for that which sustains us. I have a pastor friend down in Tucson and their church was running a once a week shelter for asylum seekers. It looked a lot like what we do for eye help, providing food and a shelter for them to stay in. But when the organization that was organizing this whole thing asked the church for a second night in the week and then a third and then a fourth the church reached its breaking point the food costs were becoming overwhelming and the wallets and the goodwill of donors was running out the electric bills and the water bills were skyrocketing Regular maintenance on the building became more regular. And my friend was spending more and more of his Saturdays, the only day he had off at church, rushing and hurrying, rushing and hurrying. Volunteers began to drop off, and the program and those who came through the asylum process began not to receive the care that they needed or deserved. And neither did the building. The church is not made to be a full week-long shelter. But this church had taken, out, taken on the brunt of what I think the government should have been doing in that. As the ask became more and more, the church became more and more exhausted. Members were hard-pressed because they believed in the work they were doing. And many wanted to do more than what they were already capable of doing. And then there was a third group that said, we want to do so much more that we don't care about our budgets. We don't care about anything. We just want to serve. This is our Christian duty, they said. And the hard part for a lot of people to chew was that, yes, that third group had a very valid point. But what happened was a split. This weird three split that where some wanted to stop completely and the others wanted to keep going it to a certain extent. And then there was a third group who wanted to give it all away. The church divided. The resources became more scarce because less people were involved. Yada, 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 yada. Now the difference here in the temp between the temple and the story of my friend's church is that I think that Following God's call and welcoming the stranger is way more important than selling goods in the temple. But when the ask was too much to handle, this church had no business in expanding that ministry. And it hurt the church. 
even in our most earnest attempts to be radical, to be extravagantly welcoming, inclusive, to be the church that we want to be, we have to be aware of what our limits are. What we are truly capable of doing. But also, what we're capable of not doing. And that's okay to say that. Because what Henry Nouwen and what Jesus are reminding us all of, whether it be for our individual lives or for our life together as a community of faith, is to stay in our lane. Solve the things that we can. Be alert for what we can solve and do well. And be alert for what we're good at. The church that I do part-time work for down in Tucson doing their communications, I'm shocked every time I go there because they're a growing church. But they're not growing in the traditional ways that we've been told that churches grow with young people. They're growing because of old people. It's amazing. But Tucson sits, and so does most of the valley here, sit where a bunch of retirees are moving to. And so that's who they're aiming for. They don't have the best rock band. They don't have the most fully funded youth and children's program. And they definitely don't have a projector in their sanctuary. They have an organ and hymnals. And people want that. And so they go to that church for that. They're good at it, and they're growing because of it. Because they aren't trying to be something that they aren't. They don't want to be a church that has the most awesome rock band. So, they don't slow down because they don't have anything holding them back. But it's amazing to see what happens when a community owns who they are and why they are here in the community. So Chalice, be on the lookout for things we know we can do. Be on the lookout for things that we can't do. Let's stay away from those things. And know that just because we can't do something doesn't mean that it won't get done. There's other people who will do things. And while we might feel quite alone here in Gilbert as one of the very few progressive Christian communities, we struggle with the thinking that if we don't, who will? But if we run ourselves down today, Koaleth reminds us in Ecclesiastes that tomorrow is coming. There's a reason why God commands us, and if it's in the Ten Commandments, I'll use the word command. God commands us to rest. And that is part of what we're supposed to be doing. God didn't put us in the business of running ourselves ragged. God put us in the business of loving, welcoming, being compassionate, listening to the voices of the oppressed, speaking up for the oppressed, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and being in the business of living a life that is modeled after Jesus. That is our business. And that won't drain us. Amen.